Welcome again to our campus. Uh, I appreciate your presentation very much. Thank you. Um, so we're going to spend a little time today talking about what we do here at Fall Point College, which is called nation building. Um, uh, yes, took the clip. I see how you operate. All right. So we are here at Fall Point College. I'll give you a little bit of backstory. Uh, we're in a neighborhood that has historically been neglected. Okay, if you've driven around this area, I am not telling you anything you haven't figured out. If things don't look like this because people invested in them, all right? We have a garbage dump that for years was closer to this community than a grocery store, okay? People shouldn't live that. All right, they shouldn't. And when we started our work here at Falkland College, we decided that, you know what, we're going to do more than just sit behind the wall and build a great school. We're going to invest in building a great community, which completely influenced the way we saw ourselves and the way in which we see the relationship of higher education to the communities they serve. So our time together today, we're going to talk about this idea that we must all be nation builders. Now, as a college president, and I also double as a professor, you know, I'm going to do a little teaching. So the first thing we have to do is define our term, right? So what is a nation building? So we define nation building as the belief that institutions of higher education should turn themselves outward and address the needs of the communities they serve and the most significant societal problems of the day. Now, we know that's a little bit broader than what people may talk about at some other school. Too bad they're wrong and we're right, okay? <laughs> now, the issue of the day, and we're just gonna let one of the great capitalists define the issue of the day for all of us. Andrew Carnegie in the Gospel of Wealth said the problem of our age is the proper administration of wealth. Right? Now, he might have been framing it a little bit differently, but what we know, really, is that it's not just the administration of wealth, it's the lack of wealth in places that desperately need it. The lack of investment in places that desperately need it. So here's how we see the problem today. 45 million Americans live in poverty. 45 million Americans live in poverty. Over 50% of the students who are going to college today are on Pell Grants. If you're on a Pell Grant, that means typically that you are a member of the lowest socioeconomic strata in the country, that you need additional support to be able to access higher education. Paul Quinn College, 85% of our students are on Pell Grant. This is one of the highest Pell Grant rates in the country. 70% of our students get zero expected family contributions. So stop and think about what that means. That means for 70% of our student body, there isn't anyone in their families that they can expect or rely on to help them with their college education. Now that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to go to college. It doesn't mean they don't deserve an education. It means that we have to be cognizant of this as we create an educational experience for these students. That means that perhaps the reason why students aren't fully engaged in a class has nothing to do with how incredibly boring you are as a professor, right? It could have everything to do with what went on before they got to class. We can't ignore that. We don't ignore that. We think that it is fundamentally important for all of us to understand these things as we go forward. We also know that we live in a country where for the first time in our history, the majority of students in public education live on free and reduced lunch block. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Imagine that you go to school and you have no idea where your meals are going to come from. You don't know where breakfast is going to come from. You don't know where lunch is going to come from. You don't know where any of it's going to come from. A fundamental insecurity, clearly I've exceeded the reach of the microphone. <laughs> so, you don't know where your meals are coming from. Something as basic and as simple as your expectation to eat. Just an expectation to eat. Now, if you don't know what you're going to eat, 
Might you also not know that the lights are going to be on when you come home? That the heat will be working? That you'll be in a place that is safe enough for you to study? And if you are worried about those things, is Chaucer really going to resonate with you? Are you going to be able to consume with algebra? Or might you just be consumed with, damn, why does my life have to be this way? Why do we make things so hard for the people who need us most? That's not who we need to be, it's not who we should be, it's not who we can be. So, if the majority of students in college already are on Pell Grant, if the majority of students now in K-12 are on free and reduced lunches, and that's before this group gets to college, then what we know is that the defining characteristic of higher education in this country moving forward is going to be poverty. Because the overwhelming majority of students are going to be from poverty-stricken families and communities. That means that education today must change. We can no longer expect it to be just what people have historically thought it to be. We have to fight that. One of the reasons why this is an unusual conversation to be had, but a necessary one, is because the people who could help solve the problem aren't. Let's think about this slide for a moment. Billionaires made so much money just last year. Not historically, not the last 10 years. Last year alone, they made so much money, they could have ended extreme poverty seven times. Seven times. How much money do you need? How much stuff can you buy? There literally comes a point where you have bought everything you need. You're just buying dumb stuff after a while. Okay? I mean, think about this. This is just one year. One year. So let's just say they decide, you know what I'm going to do? Me and my friends at the Billionaire Club, we're going to take all of our earnings in 2018 and we're going to end extreme poverty. They'll still be back to making money the next year. This is a level of selfishness and a level of societal and civic abandonment that is reprehensible. And they need to be told it's reprehensible. We need to stop making people who are selfish feel as if they are saints. They are not saints. They are reprehensible. The fact that you allow this to exist is absolutely wrong. So you know what? You can't depend on those who are above to incite revolution. Right? That's not how it works. Revolutions never start from the people who are in power because the people who revolt against them are the ones who aren't in power. I mean, think about it. What are you going to do? You know, I'm king and I'm really upset with myself, so I'm going to rebel against myself. Come on. That's not how it works. It, revolutions start from below. They start from the people who are so angry, who are so affected, and who have been disillusioned and disengaged and disempowered that they stand up and say, no more. No more. At Paul Quinn College, we have stood up and we have said, no more. So we've decided we're changing everything that we do. From this point forward, we have one goal and one goal alone. We're going to end poverty. That's it. Right? I mean, graduation rates are important. You know what? We've raised graduation rates 30%. They're going to jump another 30%. We, we figured that part out. Our retention rate has gone from 33% when I arrived to 67 68%. The first time freshmen from fall to spring have jumped to 89%. I mean, we, we figured this thing out. All right? But that's what we're supposed to do. We don't want to be praised for what you're supposed to do. Right? Do something more. That more is designing an institution that is capable of being replicated and enlisted in the fight against poverty. That's what we're here to do. And this is what we decided to do. We created our own version of higher education. Literally, there have never been urban work colleges before. We're the very first one in existence, and urban work colleges take the 150-year-old model of work colleges, which require students to work at the same time that they go to school, right? Our students, this, this is the model. The difference is the other work colleges are in rural areas. 
So they can engage the students in farming, what well, well, we have a farm, but it's, it's a little different. And pottery, we, we don't have pottery. I don't even know what it's called to do pottery, right? Uh, pottery and all the other things. So we engage the corporate community to do that. So this model allows us, and this is how it works. All of our residential students participate in the work program. That means that they go to work. The students work between 10 to 15 hours per week. All right? Now, many of the students work in big corporate places like AT&T, JCPenney, FedEx, JP Morgan Chase. Some work in places like the Community Foundation of Texas. Some work in places like area independent schools. Uh, our largest partner is the Dallas Leadership Foundation. So they work in nonprofits as well. And these businesses teach the students how to apply what it is that they are learning in class to their real world lives, which we think is sort of important. They receive an annual cash stipend. We thought that was sort of important because you know, here's the thing people forget. Everyone is already working. 70 more than 70% of the students who are in college today who are considered dependent students, they work more than 20 hours per week. Over 80% of the students who are in college today who are considered independent students, they're working more than 30 hours per week. The difference is students are trying to manage home, school, working. Right? What we said was, what if we collapse school and working and give them the ability just to focus on life and learning. And give them back 33% of the time in their lives. We thought that was important. That's what this allows us to do. We give the students an option of graduating with less than $10,000 a day. Now many students choose to graduate with more than that because for, for a lot of them, this is the first time their families have had access to capital, which is an entirely different conversation and a much, much bigger problem. One of the other things we did was we got rid of textbooks. All right? And here's the thing. We are unknowingly creating a cash system in our classroom. We had some students who could afford books, some who couldn't. Students, they weren't choosing not to buy books because they didn't want to. They were choosing to use the money for something more pressing in their life. Turns out there's lots of other material that you can find on the internet. So instead of giving professors the ability to sign books they've written and had their pockets, <laughs> right, we decided to do away with textbooks and use open resource material. And, yep. <laughs> Coming to the curriculum at Paul <laughs> <laughs> So this is the model. This is how tuition worked this year. Our old cost was charging roughly $24,000 for students for school. We cut that down to $14,495. The $9,900 is for students who live off campus. This is how you pay for it. Almost $6,000 comes from the Pell Grant. Uh, $5,000 comes from the work program credit. So think about this. Right out of the gate, 85% of our students, $11,000 of the 14,500 is already covered. Right? The average student picks up another 1,300, I'm sorry, another 1,200 in grants and SEOG money, which leaves the unmet need around 2,300, which means you can graduate four years on less than $10,000. It's just that simple. <laughs> so we think this model works. We've been using it the last four or five years. It's working beautifully. We can't meet the need for students who want to come right now. To be honest with you, the last three or four years, we've had to use waiting lists to manage the desire for people to come, which has never happened in our you know, 146 year history. So we are thrilled about that. But that's a problem, right? Because you want to be able to provide an opportunity for those individuals who have qualified to attend the school. So what we're going to do is we're going to expand nationally. We're going to create a national network of urban work college. You're going to live in cities now where you will look up and there will be a Paul Quinn College there. If there's not a Paul Quinn College there, then we will partner with another institution and create a consortium where that institution will combine and adopt our format. 
And if that doesn't work, we're currently in discussion with a very, very well-known, large, publicly funded state institution, not in Texas, that will adopt the model and will embed it in there as well. So what we have decided to do is bring our model to the people. Okay, because the model works. It's not enough to have a solution and not be able to scale. Right? We want more people to be able to embrace that. And, and this is critically, critically important. This is part of ending poverty. We've got more people who need to have access to the ability to earn a living. It's great to go to school, but it's great to go to school and also have a job and have that job tie into what it is you're interested in so that you have the ability to work and earn and plan for a life that is a life that lifts you out of the ravages of poverty. So this, this looks better in the dark. It's, it's purple and black. It's striking visually. You would love it if you could see it. OK? All right. There it is. All right. There it is. That is our ethos, we over me. We believe that the needs of a community supersede the wants of an individual. You do not get to be selfish at Paul Quinn College. You do not get to be selfish in the Quinn Nation. There is no place for selfishness among nation builders. You all are going to be nation builders. You're here today because you have an interest in something greater than yourself. That is noble, but our job is to point you in the direction of how to achieve these goals, to help you be bigger than yourself. This is how you do that. You do that by embracing the problems of the day, providing solutions that can be scaled, getting behind those institutions that are doing so, writing really big checks to those places, like Cafe Momentum and Paul Spring College. I just want to throw that out there. A little plug, no one clap. I don't think they did our needs, Chad. I don't think they did our needs, right? But, but the point really is, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring enough to engage in the work of the day. Thank you for caring enough to even ask the question and to seek the knowledge. But that's just the first step. The next step is actually doing the work. So again, you're always welcome at Paul Quinn College. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being Nation Builders. Thank you. <laughs>